Today's date is 15 August 2023. My name is Dennis Gill with the Americans in Wartime Experience. I'm in Fairfax, Virginia, and I've got the pleasure of speaking with Donald Morgan. Thank you, Donald, for sitting down and talking to us. Appreciate you opening up your house to us. Uh, if you could just give us a little bit of background on who you are. Where were you born, grow up, go to school, that kind of thing? Okay. I was uh, born in San, San Antonio, Texas, actually on Fort Sam Houston, because my father, who we'll talk about later maybe, uh, was director of flying training and education for the Army Air Corps okay. at Randolph Field. But I was born on uh, Fort Sam Houston, which I've always been proud of. Okay. I visited there later with my mother, many years later, and where my sister was born, and where my brother was born, and where I was born, and for one of the astronauts, and I forget which one was born there, uh, it's now a parking lot. Okay. So, <laughs> we were we were sort of disappointed in that. But yeah. At least I got to see where I was born. Right. And I grew up. My first uh, first years were in. Uh, on Randolph Field, and we had a bungalow near, right in the set, near the center circle. And I, uh, I let's see, we were there until I was about six, five or six. Okay. And I, I'll more of that in a, in a while. Then we moved to Harlingen, Texas. My father uh, built in a uh, the aerial gunnery school at Harlingen, and then from there. Uh, I went to about the fourth or fifth grade and then moved to Keesler Air Force Base mm -hmm. in Biloxi, Mississippi. Mm -hmm. My dad was CO of that base. And then my father, uh, then my father went transferred to uh, Peking, China with General Marshall. And we, uh, we, his, evidently he, after Marshall's, um, uh, Negotiations were over between the communists and nationalists. My father was moved to uh, uh, Fifth Air Force headquarters in Japan, okay. and we had since traveled up to Seattle to get on a boat, the USS O'Hara, to go to Peking or okay. P P uh, yeah Peking at the time, and uh, we uh, when we arrived in Seattle, my mother got a cable from my father saying he had been moved from Peking to Nagoya, Japan, which incidentally we're going to visit in a couple of weeks. Okay. And uh, so my mother, I can remember saying, well, the ship's going in the right direction, so I'm not going to tell anybody. <laughs> so we went across on the O'Hara. It was the true slow boat to China. It took mm -hmm. us 30 days wow. to get to Japan. We hit this edge of a typhoon, which was sort of interesting to me. It, 10 years old, but it wasn't interesting to my mother. She was not happy with that. So, but we did, blew a boiler the, the, in, in the O'Hare, it was an old victory ship. Okay. The props actually came out of the water and the whole mm. ship would shake and they blew a boiler. So they had to pull into Yokohama. So my father had uh, somebody pick us up in Yokohama. We were the only three people, myself, my brother, mm. and, and uh, me. And my mother got off the boat, and uh, we were taken down to Nagoya. So I spent two years in Nagoya. Okay. Nine months of it in a hotel called the Kanko Hotel, which I have reservations for now to go back. <laughs> it's a new hotel, no, but at least same name. the idea that counts. Yeah. And then after Nagoya, uh, General Wolf was commander of the uh, Fifth Air Force, like my dad, so he took him to uh, the uh, Air Materiel Command at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. Ohio, okay. and I did the seventh and seventh grade, sixth and seventh grade. There, I got sort of messed up on the grades because we didn't have any school. When I spent nine months in the Kanko Hotel in Nagoya, there was no school. I became, became very mm. good at pool and ping pong <laughs> with my my other friends who were in right. the same hotel. So anyway, uh, being uh, being in uh, Patterson Air Force Base was really an experience for me because you could go down beside the uh, I guess it was about probably about the 14th hole on the golf course and okay. overlook the end of the runway mm -hmm. and that runway at the time was the longest almost anywhere one okay. of the longest runways and I got to see the testing of the 
ejection seats out of the back mm. seat of a T-33. It was open and it would fly over the end of the runway, pop this thing out. I saw it on one occasion, the seat went out and hit the ground and bounced. <laughs> the shoot never opened. Right. <laughs> wow. And then I saw then I saw them actually do a few of the actual actual ones. They had a, a B-26 there, they called the Wingless Wonder. They chopped off the wings on it and they used it to test, it's painted a bright red. And on that runway they used it to test the brakes. And they'd run that thing down and then slam on the <laughs> brakes. <laughs> and it would, you know, they, watching these things, I saw a B-36, which is the largest bomber. Mm -hmm. They had treads on it. And I watched this thing land off the runway because they remember during the Cold War that we didn't know what was going to happen in the air bases, so these big airplanes might have to land, not in a cornfield, but they must have something for them. But I watched this thing come down, and it just threw up dirt, just like the like a, a racing boat mm -hmm. throws up that plume. That's what it did in the, in the, wow. on, the on the dirt with this V-36 when it hit the ground and landed. Wow. It's really amazing. Yeah. Uh, so I, I got to climb over all the captured German uh, airplanes and that that they had uh, and from World War II they brought back to Wright-Patterson they had a very large area where they they just sat they had B, a V1 and they had uh, the Comet the, the uh, rocket powered one that they used mm -hmm. for a while my buddies and I found a hole in the fence and we used to go play on all these things they're all in museums yeah. now yeah. it was uh, it was really amazing and also probably one of the few people that have alive that have heard of actual buzz bomb the v1 mm -hmm. they actually put it on the back of a truck and fired this thing up and you know, you know that's that yeah. sound typical sound of buzz bomb so while i was there as a kid besides playing 18 <laughs> holes of golf during the summer uh it was a real experience to, to see these all this military stuff there Oh, also one little thing that I did. I, w I had a motor scooter. My dad got me a motor scooter so I could get around the base. And I went out once to the end of the field off where the, where the uh, firefighters used to, you know how they burn airplanes and then practice putting out mm -hmm. I found a P-61 Black Widow night fighter out there that they hadn't done anything to yet. I climbed in it and I pulled out the yoke because I knew it was going to get burned, uh, I pulled out the yoke on the uh, co-pilot side, put it on my scooter, and took it home. And my dad, he was uh, Inspector General for AMC headquarters, so I didn't have to worry about it. And he knew they were just going to burn it up anyway, right. so he let me keep it as a souvenir. Wow. And uh, Very cool. I finally gave it to the, uh, it was given to the Confederate Air Forces at the time, now the Commemorative Air Force. Yeah. And they have it in their collection. Wow! I have. I've been trying to get hold of the of uh, the guy, and haven't been a good job yet to let him know the history of it. But uh, I'll do. That's on yeah. my list of things yeah. to do. Yeah. Wow. And then from there, went down to San Angelo, Texas, and my dad was CEO of the <clears throat> Goodfellow Air Force Base, and he. Uh, uh, this was in 1950. Let's see, 1950. We went down there. And he took, became CEO of Goodfellow. And that was uh, uh, a, the T-6, or the AT-6, uh, the training pilots. Was, I think it was the last pilot training for the, uh, for the Air Force in, in the AT-6s before they transferred it to a uh, jet. Okay. So anyway, that was interesting because every night I'd go to sleep to the night flying of those. I can, I can tell a lot of airplanes now by the by their sound. Right. Uh, it's interesting how you get your ears tuned to those things. And then from there I went down at my last year, uh, I graduated from Harlingen High. We went back, my dad retired in the Lower Rio Grande Valley. And uh, I uh, gra graduated from the same high school my, my sister and brother graduated from. Okay. So anyway, uh, that was up to that point and then I got an, uh, where to go to school. I got an appointment to uh, West Point. I, I got an appointment to the Naval Academy. 
I got an appointment uh, to NROTC at Rice University. Mm -hmm. And interesting enough, my class from uh, West Point was 59, was the first class from the Air Force Academy. Okay. Uh, I like to tell myself, <laughs> I, <laughs> I, they told me I didn't make the first class the Air Force Academy because I wasn't a captain of a team, I wasn't this, I wasn't mm -hmm. that, I was just a student. And uh, they pretty much loaded up that first class. Yeah. I know that they know that. Yeah. But they said I had a spot. I could have a slot in the second one. And then I, my brother graduated from West Point in '52, and I thought the hundred and something class from West Point felt better than the second class from the Air Force yeah. Academy, even though my whole family was Air Force. Right. So I, uh, I decided to go to West Point, which I. Never regretted that. Yeah, that, that, right. that was uh, the best thing I ever did. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so I graduated from West Point. Uh, I I was married. I graduated on June third. I was married on June third to my first wife. And uh, I went to pilot training. And pilot training. My dad always said, since he flew for thirty five years, or thirty six years. He always said, if you can drive a car, you can fly an airplane. And actually, he's pretty much right. I soloed, I don't know how many hours solo I had, but when I got into aerobatics, I got my father's fighter pilot eyes. I had 2010 in one eye and 2015 mm -hmm. in the other. I got my mother's stomach. <laughs> and she, you know, she, she was susceptible. And I learned that a long time ago, you know, right, that right. this might not be the thing. And so, Towards the end, before I had to, I had to leave. It was just sort of getting up and thinking. I hope I don't throw up this time. And you know, it was. Yeah. It, it, and then after a while, I was just focused on that and not the flying. The flying wasn't hard, and because uh, I've been driving since I was 16, but uh, that did me in. So then the Air Force decided I was going to be a communications officer because they had a shortage of communication officers. So I, uh, I went down to Keesler Air Force Base, which my father had mm -hmm. been commander of. They even have a picture of me with the old Keesler News open with my, with my father there and me pointing to my father. Right. So right. that's in the, the Keesler paper too. So I went down there and uh, I got through, got through the uh, school. And then an interesting ha thing happened. Oh, this uh, before. Uh, before I went to that school, I'd already been slated to go to, to the, uh, to the to communication mm -hmm. school. While I was still uh, at, in Georgia at my flight school, I was packing up and I got a call. And I said, this is so and so and I'd, I'd like, I knew your father, I'd like to come over. And he did. And it turns out he was the vice commander of the, of the uh, uh, of one of the commands, the Air Research and Development Command. Okay. His vice commander. He had three stars, and here he is sitting with the second lieutenant. <laughs> wow. And he he was talking to me, and he said, we just talked a little bit. And then he said, uh, "What do you want to do?" And uh, he, I told my going down there. He says, "What about after school? What would you like to do?" I said, I really want to go in the Air Research and Development Command, which I did. Right. That was sort of my ideal. And he said, I'll see what I can do about it. And, and, uh, and then he told me why. It seems like when he was a pilot at Randolph, and my father was director of flying training and education for the Air Corps, it seems like they caught him flying around pylons as a student. They have two smokestacks down there, at least right. they did. And he was flying like a pylon thing. And uh, they caught him, they got his tail number or something. And so he had to meet a board. Hmm. And you know who was president of that board. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> he said, I don't know what he said, whether my father just chewed him out or had him walk their line right. with a parachute, but he could have washed him out. Yeah. Very easily yeah, could have yeah. washed him out. And he said, your father gave me the chance and here I am. And, he said, I'm, I'm going to return the favor. And I thought, wow. thank you, Dad. <laughs> so after school, I had a letter 
from General Bernie Shriver, the commander of the Air Research and Development Command, that he wanted me to go to the Site Activation Torch 18 in uh, Malsham Air Force Base, Montana, where they were putting in the first wing of Minuteman missiles mm. as the communications officer in that, in that. Uh, and that was just, I mean, stunning. Right. So I went up there, some of the absolute incredible people. Uh, General uh, Goldsworthy was the commander, and I would always could measure myself on how commanders should act with Goldsworthy. He was one of, I don't know, 20 or 30 uh, commanders in the Air Force that were chosen to uh, head special groups throughout. And he was number 18 on the list. Wow. Okay. That's why he got uh, the site activation death force there. But he was such a gentleman, so nice. He just died a couple of years ago. I always regret he was in Southern California that I never got by to thank him mm -hmm. for being my first big boss. My next boss was a uh, colonel who was an FP-47 pilot in Europe, got shot down once, almost got captured. Uh, he was wild. <laughs> I mean, these are impressions I get from guys that I'm, I'm looking up to as a brand new right. second lieutenant besides my father, but he was already in his 50s at the time. These guys were younger. Like we were going to do a, uh, I, he was going to, I was helping him out. He was going to do a, a lecture or someplace and he had to get into a building and he says, the damn building's locked. A typical fighter pilot looked around, bam, <laughs> walked in and opened it. He said, we'll tell him the wind did it or something right. like that. I mean, these guys are just incredible. Uh, way to start a, a, a career. And then after after that, uh, the Air Force got me back and uh, I was I was sent over to uh, Germany to be a radio link commander uh, in Chateauroux, France. So okay, so I had two kids at the time, little kids. So we get on an airplane. Oh, in the meantime, Headquarters USAF was setting things down. Uh, uh, the the commander of Shadowru had already sent me a, a thing, a, a, a tele telegram or a message, and also of the USAF saying uh, we're shutting down the radio radio link because we don't need it anymore. And then I get something from the headquarters that says, "Don't pay any attention to them. That's where you're going." <laughs> you know that kind of right. thing. So uh, the last word I had was from Air Force saying, go to Chateauroux. So I go to Chateauroux, spend the night at the hotel in Paris. Nobody met us, because usually they have somebody come up. Mm -hmm. But I did meet a guy from Chateauroux who just brought up somebody from Chateauroux to Paris. Okay. So he, I, I got a ride with him and the family down to Chateauroux. So we go in, I go in and I'm, I'm, I'm he takes me in to see the commander. And the commander says, uh, have you signed in yet? I said, no, sir. And he said, how would you like to go to Ramstein, Germany? Well, you know, I knew a little about what's going on, but I didn't want to get stuck out in the middle of no place. Right. You know? So I said, uh, yeah, that'd be a good idea. So he picks it up, calls the commander, and they said, yeah, we got a slot for him, send him up. So we get back in a, a car, go up to go up to uh, Ram Ramstein and I sign in there and it was uh, I was he I, I ran a uh, small group that had all the Air Force cabling system in Europe mm. plus I had the uh, forward air controller units which was something else anyway uh, so I went up there. The one perk that I got, a, I got an apartment immediately because normal because I was an out of country transfer. So I got an apartment the next day, and then the following day I took a train up to Wolfsburg and picked up my Volkswagen and drove it all the way back. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean everything just seemed to fall in place very nicely. Uh, my time there, my my NCOs particularly one called Sergeant Love. My NCOs were absolutely incredible. That's one thing I learned about. I didn't have any NCOs in my first assignment. It's the first time I had NCOs working for me. These guys were incredible. They saved my rear end so many times. Mm -hmm. 
particularly when somebody was trying to take me over in, within the headquarters. The guy sent down a thing that said, uh, you know, why don't you join me and so he could be my boss and all that stuff. Well, I got out of that one. But it was my, he sent down a whole list of things that our, our group had messed up on. So I gave it to my NCOs. I said, see what you can do with this. And they uh, looked at it, then all of a sudden they started laughing. And then they, it was all these guys' fault that were trying to pass it on us. They wrote this whole thing up. And I sent it back up to the commander to him. He comes down wide eyed, he's a major, comes down wide eyed, like, oh my God, what did you do? What, <laughs> I just was asking about it. I knew what he was trying to do. So that was the last of that. But it was my, my NCOs that, you know, they could do anything. Right. They they also shut down, we also shut down all the lines when de Gaulle got out of NATO. We had to shut down everything okay. going to France. Yeah. That was interesting. So after that, uh, they moved me up to plans. And uh, I had the three drawers full of, uh, three safes full of TS. That's when I learned the importance of taking care of confidential TS information mm -hmm. because you are really on the line uh, right. and you have, you have to go through everything to make sure when they pass it down to you, you don't want anything missing or sign for anything that isn't there. Yeah. It, would, it was, nobody understands that like somebody in the military does take care of mm -hmm. top secret. Yeah. So after that, uh, I got my orders back and uh, I went to uh, a year in training, uh, training with industry, with uh, RCA. That was an eye-opener. I didn't know it at the time. At that time, lasers, they showed us laser things mm -hmm. at RCA. And they showed us a cane that as a guy, a blind person would walk along, it would show a laser beam that would shake if it, would, it was a drop-off. Okay. And they didn't think much else that you could use lasers for. I mean, it was sort of early. That's when they sold their recording stuff with laser. They had the patents on it okay. to Japanese business for almost a song. Right. Was a, that was a, a management mistake big time. Right. Would become CD player, CDs. Huh? Would be CDs are read by lasers and yeah. Yeah, and they, they spearheaded. Yeah. And then that technology. another one. I uh, we would we would travel around to different. Uh, sites and we saw the uh, let's see it was oh yes it was the tone we saw tone when it was only between major centers before it ever made it out to okay. the out to the uh, regular telephones and I saw and worked with a guy that talked about cell towers and how phones were going to be you could work right with cell tower. Wow. I even had I even had a manual on, on this is back in 1963. Wow. Uh, of how they were going to do it, and you know, mm -hmm. it's these things you think of. What if I'd invested here? Right. <laughs> yeah. There, you know. So it was. Uh, we got to see that. There's a whole lot of things that, that uh, got to go down to uh, uh, the missile sites down in Florida. And uh, they were still, they were shooting, they were using uh, Atlas at the time, mm -hmm. just before they went to the moon. And they had just been told that by the president that you're going to do the moon. Right. I was, I was in, I was in Ramstein when Kennedy got assassinated. So, but he had, he had already told him, and you could see the pro, and the vertical assembly building, the VAB. Uh, we got to go up in it and see the, mm. the actual uh, uh, atlas all assembled. And it was amazing when you get in the elevator at the bottom and just go up and up and up and it just like it was never going to stop. Wow. It, was a, it was a fantastic experience to be inside the VAB. And then uh, after the training with industry, I didn't know if I was going out in the line, but I think I'd been classified as a staff officer by that time or special units officer. So I went to a unit in Oklahoma City that had the programmers for all the Air Force. And I got the ones for auditing, the Automated Digital Network One. And this at the time was the largest packet switching operation in the world. And I had all the programmers working for wow. me. 
and they had them uh, all over the world. I had them in, I had several in Europe, and they went in teams. You had an NCO mm -hmm. and an, an officer working on this. Okay. Things. And it, it took eight months of uh, study for these people to learn how to do it. And I had, at the end, I had guys, if they had a, pro they were working with problems that were one in 10 million. And these, I had guys so good that they could, they had book, the books were mm -hmm. like, I think three of them that thick or bigger. And they could just almost stick their finger in and flip it open to where, to where right. the problem was and then hunt it down. Wow. Uh, I had uh, one a woman named Judy Skolny. She was a captain. She was one of the most intelligent people, persons I've ever met in my entire life. She actually, when she got out, she started her own business with computers. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember one time we, we were divided in three divisions in the, in this uh, in this group, and. Uh, one of my buddies was running one of the other ones. Actually, he was in my wedding with one of the best men. And he said, uh, one time he said, Don, he called me up and said, Don, uh, can, you ha can you send somebody to get a fresh look at this operation? And I said, uh, sure, okay. So I said, Judy, go down and see what they're doing. <laughs> and she went down, and she was back about 45 minutes later. And I said, what happened? And she said, it was an easy problem. They've been working on it for two or three weeks and they couldn't do it. And she let them know it when she went out. They hated her, wow. but they sure respected her. Right. <laughs> because she was one of those types that lets you know where you stand. Mm -hmm. And she, she must have really reamed them out for that one. But, but uh, it, was, it was so funny, which she, she was just a, a miracle. I took, the, I took exams for, uh, to become a, uh, uh, an officer in the embassy and uh, attache, remember attache? Mm -hmm. And we had to take tests and it was three parts and it was very, com I mean for me it was very complicated and so I remember she decided to take it at the same time. I'm trying to give you an idea of what kind of intelligence this woman yeah. had. And so I'm sitting there and after about no, it was a three-hour exam, I mm -hmm. think. After about uh, 30, 40 minutes, she gets up and walks out. I think, I wonder if she's having problems. Wow. And when time was up, I was halfway through the last one. I didn't make it all the way through. Because I don't have a language gene, to be honest <laughs> with you. And uh, it dis I discovered she almost maxed it. Wow. And I... There's only one other person I've ever known that even came close, guy that w worked for me yeah. that had that kind of intelligence right. or in, a, in any other situation. Yeah. But she just recently died a few, uh, last year of uh, cancer. It's unfortunate. Mm. So anyway, after that one, uh, I, I actually uh, volunteered for Vietnam because uh, none of my other in my family had made it in the military except the ones back in revolutionary times, right? And so I, uh, I decided it was part of my duty since yeah. I spent four years at West Point. It was really my duty to, uh, to go. What year was this? I went over in uh, nineteen uh, seventy to seventy one. I spent most of the time. I, I went over in December of 70 and came home in December 71 okay. in Vietnam. Uh, our job in Vietnam at, at the time, oh, I'll get to that in a minute. So anyway, I, I volunteered for Vietnam and then they sent me to, to uh, the advanced level communication school back at Biloxi okay. and Keesler. And then I, uh, from there I went over, my, my wife and children uh, stayed at uh, Patrick Air Force Base, which is adjacent to the missile facilities. Right. There, I guess the missile, missile facilities are on it. But they had a spare house there. Okay. And since I was going to Vietnam, she just moved right mm -hmm. in. It was very nice. It was one of the narrow, on the narrow part of the island. 
on the back was the Banana River, mm -hmm. and then in the front was was the uh, Atlantic. So it was a nice place to have the kids and yeah. my, my wife at the time. So uh, from there, I went over to Vietnam. <clears throat> I was assigned to uh, 1964th Com Group, and uh, their job at the time was to turn all the Air Force facilities, communications facilities, over to the to the VNAF, the Vietnamese National Air Force, the Vietnam Air Force. And uh, so that's what I got into. And I also got a, uh, I had some really great guys working for me there. Uh, it was, uh, I had a guy, a uh, uh, captain working for him, Larry Winnick, Larry Winnick. He went on to become a, uh, uh, the, the head of communication for the Pacific area for, for uh, the Air Force. So, well, what are your first impressions when you get to Vietnam? The first impressions, my actually my impressions when I went back on a trip later is more <laughs> it was more blatant than this one. This one was. Uh, I guess when you first get into a combat zone, even though I, I was I was on Tonsonit, and uh, they they rocket it every once in a while, and yeah. they have a thing like this big voice or something like that would come on and say we're under rocket attack, everybody do it. So the first thing you do when you're first there, I had an upper upper floor one, and I overlooked the flight line, and uh, so you get on your flak jacket, your helmet, you run down and get in this thing. Then the next time you know, the big voice comes up, you just pull a flat jacket over, you sort of put the helmet there. Yeah. And after that, you just sleep through it or just roll over and say, if they kill me, they kill me, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. It's amazing in a combat zone. You don't worry about that anymore. Uh, I was there <clears throat> when I was, one of my jobs was when we had people visiting uh, from out, outside, uh, my job was to take them down shopping or, you know, the elephants. I don't know if you've seen the Vietnam elephants. They're a thing. When you walk into a house and you see it's a flat top, oh. it's just sort of a yeah. ceramic elephant. Vietnam all the way. <laughs> and so I'd take them down to the Vietnam place so they'd get their elephants right. or whatever. But that was during the period when you were when you were riding around and had an open jeep that I would drive around in. That's when the, the, the guys the uh, guys on the motor scooters we're dropping grenades in the, in okay. the, in the yeah. things. We lost people doing that. But after a while, you just sort of try and be aware of it. My uh, my my friend Larry Winnick was sitting there with a. We were in a taxi downtown Vietnam. He was sitting there like this, and we're just chatting. And before you know it, a hand reached in, bam, pulled his watch off, and the. It's just like the Sioux, if they get a coup, he was running with that thing and weaving through traffic. Away. And then he just looked at it and said, well, I got it. <laughs> and uh, it was it was interesting times there. Yeah. But you didn't feel, you didn't feel, except for some of the, some of the wounded that came back Vietnamese would, would beg someplace. But basically, Saigon was pretty, was pretty tight. There was there was really any problems there. The guys in the bush had it. I mean, those yeah. guys were the ones that were going through it. And uh, I never claimed to be a combat veteran, other than yeah. getting rocketed. I, I I did one thing stupid. We had somebody trying to come through the fence once, and they were shooting up the place. There were tracers going all the place. And my buddy and I were just standing there. We we're about a hundred yards away, just standing there watching it. How dumb, <laughs> you know? <laughs> right. Yeah. You know. But anyway, you know, those are things that happen in a, in a, uh, in a zone. Yeah. Talk about being uh, involved in a rocket attack. What goes uh, through your mind when that's happening? Well, that was just the same thing. It, you know, you hear boom, 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 and you turn over and go to sleep. Because they always do it at night. Yeah. Uh, I saw one, one surreal time. I was, in, I was in the shower upstairs, taking a shower, and I look out of, way across the wire, and I see somebody trying to, they're trying to penetrate it, and everything's broke, hell going on, and you're just, uh -huh. you know, it's, uh, being in that area, it's, it's, it's surrealistic yeah. sometimes, yeah. you know. But I wasn't really, I wasn't per se affected by that. And my boss, 
Um, my boss is a colonel. I won't use his name, but he was a, he was a great guy. Anyway, at towards the end of my tour, uh, we got a paper, and it says, "Where would you like to be stationed?" And uh, my first one was NATO. I want to go back. I want to go to NATO. I'll tell you why in a second. And then I wanted to go here and there and there. So about a week later, I'm sitting at my desk and my buddy comes in, Larry, and says, uh, the boss wants to see you. Okay. So I go in and sit down. I'm looking at him. He has a paper in his hand. <laughs> and he says, Don, I see you want to go to NATO. And I said, yes, sir. And I'm thinking, uh-oh, here it comes. Yeah. And he said, that isn't anything but a damn country club. Now, I knew that because my headquarters right. around Germany was butted up against the NATO headquarters. We were in like a T. And every time I tried to go down to the NATO headquarters and see guys, they were always off on vacation. German, you know, mm -hmm. uh, French. You know, every, everybody had their own vacation the day, day off. They were never there. I thought, yeah, this is a country <laughs> club. <laughs> so uh, I said, okay, yes, sir. And he says, you don't want to go there. I said, okay. He said, you want to go where the action is. Oh, I can remember that. I mean, I'm a direct quote. I want to go where the action is. And I said, yes, sir. He says, you want to go to the Pentagon on the air staff. And I said, okay. And so that was that. I left. I was thinking, maybe he'll forget. <laughs> he didn't forget <laughs> yeah. anything. So my orders came in. Air staff, Pentagon. Okay. I'll live with it. Turns out, Best assignment ever, because you suddenly realize everything flows downhill, and if you're at the very top, <laughs> you're the one pushing it off the edge if you have to. Right. I was never quite that bad, but that that was that was it. And you could you, you had to get things done. Yeah. You know, like uh, I remember in one instance, SAC was moving a headquarters from the Pacific back, and I don't know where, I don't even remember where they were going, whether it was back to, to California or Hawaii or Guam or wherever. So I had to make sure the communications did everything okay. And so I started calling around, and I got a round robin. I called at least, talked to him, talked to him, talked to him, <laughs> talked to him, back to me. So I finally got to the guy, the uh, the civilian that was in charge of actually doing it. And I got him on the phone, and it's the only time I've ever threatened, any, threatened anybody, but it was sort of a politely threatening, because I said, my three-star general just told a four-star general, who told another four-star general, who happens to be the SAC commander, that this was going to be done on time. <laughs> you know what I, because he was giving me all these, well, we have to do this p paperwork, and we have to make sure. Right. And I, I said, no, don't worry about the paperwork. Just get everything done. You do the paperwork later. And he got it done. I don't yeah. know if he had anything to do. He may have done it right, right anyway. But Because uh, my little rear end was on, <laughs> on the mm -hmm. table, too, for that one. So anyway, that was, uh, those are the kind of things that happened up there. And it was, uh, met some wonderful, smart, oh, God. I was so blessed in my career with smart NCOs and smart officers that worked for me and smart officers that were over me. I only had one that was sort of a pill, but uh, I think, well, maybe two. But that's, that's pretty good yeah. for, for, for having 20 years in the service. So anyway, uh, after Vietnam, uh, uh, getting back into the air staff, air staff was good. I was there for two years, about two and a half years. And then I got a thing that says, uh, you're being moved down to J-6. Well, the colonel who sent me there was now a two-star running J-6. He knew I was up on the air staff, and he had me come down to the JCS as an action officer. Yeah. And that in itself was, was interesting. Uh, in my room, I had four people. I had a, a Navy guy. He was a captain, and he said he, used to, he, used to, he was going to get he was going to retire from there. And he used to say, "Don, when I was on my ship, I was God, 
and now here I am. I have a desk. And he he was the nice. So he he went back to San Diego and retired. And then I had a, a uh, two, I think there were two army guys in there also, and they were they were smart there mm -hmm. and uh, had a good boss. Uh, you remember some interesting things like I, I, I sent out a, a letter doing something and I put on a cover letter and that my boss said come on Don uh, let's go in and see and this guy was the was, he wasn't the, he was one of the chief of staffs oh I guess he was the uh, I don't know but anyway he was a three-star admiral pretty high up I was a major at the time so we go in there and the guy says, the Navy's different than the Air Force. Mm -hmm. And he harumphs and looks at it and says, well, it's cut back, there's too much information. And I started ar not arguing with him, but stating my case, right. so to speak. Right. And <laughs> my Army colonel boss was <laughs> oh, God, don't do this. And I was arguing, because in the Air Force, and the guy that was there as a J-6, you know, you don't, just say, roll over and be a yes man. Mm -hmm. You state your case, even if you have to argue a little bit. When right. the decision's made, the decision's made. Yeah. But up until then, you better be telling what you think, because he didn't want any you know, guys right. on their knees right. saying, oh God, tell me what to do. Yeah. So I, I, and finally the guy said, that's it. I said, okay. Yeah, my, 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 my boss said, that's enough. <laughs> we <laughs> left. But I, that's the one time I argued with a three-star admiral. Not very much, but a little bit. Yeah. So uh, all I did, I took a pair, few of the paragraphs out and moved them back <laughs> into the main body. And I, that's it. He was probably right all along yeah. anyway. He was a little verbose. So anyway, let's see what else we got on there. So that was, uh, that was a good, good, good tour. And during that, when I uh, got a divorce, I was divorced, and I met my current wife. Mm. And uh, just things happen. Yeah. And it was it, my first one was a casualty of Vietnam, I think. You know, yeah. a lot of guys had that happen. So anyway, um, after. It was interesting because my tour on the JCS was a what they call a purple suit tour. It was out of the Air Force. Okay. And as a matter of fact, while I was on it, at some, at some, I had an Air Force guy come up to another major say, "You better not come back in the Air Force. You're really, you know, blah blah blah." Because I, I rolled over him a few times to, right. because I had to get it what my boss wanted. So anyway. Um, After, after that, my purple suit operation is not in the is not in the United States. So I was allowed because there's a limit on how long you can stay in in Washington, mm -hmm. the military person. I don't know, it was uh, six years or something like that. And because I was out of country, my boss got me over to to Defense Communications Agency. Okay. And I was right back working on Autodin 1, Autodin 2, because they're upgrading the whole system. But that's what is right on the beginning, and this is in 77. And this was the, just the beginning of uh, people thinking about what's coming after Autodin. Packet switching was, was starting to come up you know, mm -hmm. in the communication business. But they worked on it a long time. I was the, I was the deputy, uh, and the guy that, that was running was a colonel, smart as a whip. He was really a, a neat guy. Yeah, he, he was putting all his energy into it, and it finally came down to they had to cancel it because they couldn't assure the, the security of the, of the okay. computer system, of the, of the and because when you got so many programmers working on it, they like to put hooks into it so they can get in without right. having to go any right. long way or anything like that. And all programmers pretty much the same. Plus, programmers are different people. I learned that when I was in Oklahoma City. You can't treat them like everybody right. else because they think in a different way. Okay. And my guys used to get in trouble. Like, when I was in Oklahoma City, I got a report back. Well, 
lieutenant so-and-so blah 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 from the commander who wasn't a communications officer they just stuck him in there yeah and then it came over to my boss it came down to me and blah 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 and this is the guy they found he was reading the newspaper with his feet up on his desk in the communication center he's the guy that you say i got a prob i got a problem blah 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 could stick his finger and open it up mm -hmm. and solve it in 30 minutes yeah and they didn't understand this kind of thinking, <laughs> or, or the one that they got, got chewed out because he was wearing a civilian overcoat in his uniform, mm. you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. So I learned, I learned a lot about programmers, that they're a different breed and, and you have to treat them differently. Yeah. You can't treat them like, oh, let me tell you another story about, I, I had, there were army, in, in Italy there was an army audit in unit, this was in Oklahoma City, and there was a, uh, an Air Force one, and one, one day I got a call in, one of my NCOs got a call and he says, uh, Major Morgan, there's Sergeant so-and-so Army who's, who's a programmer at, uh, in uh, Italy, and I, for, I, I forgot the name of, this, of the place where it was, and he said, uh, they're sending him back. His, his secondary MOS is truck driver and they're gonna make him a truck driver. And I thought, oh my God, they can't do this. I called up the detailer, the army detailer, a woman. And I said, uh, you have this guy, uh, uh, army sergeant, and he's, uh, you, you just assigned him to drive trucks. And I was wondering if you could uh, assign him to the Air Force and keep up his, you know, working on this program and think blah, blah, right. blah. She told me so many words to mind my own business. The army knows what they're doing. Goodbye. <laughs> and I just wanted to cry. You know, that's, it's like throwing a ramp around out in the trash. And so that's where I learned about detailers and how the army does right. things sometimes. Yeah. I was fortunate. So anyway, where was I? We were, uh, oh, I went over to DCA. I was working on Audit M1. And uh, great people there too. And then finally, I retired out of out of uh, out of the audit in, or out of the. Uh, uh, oh, I did have a good a good office at the Defense Communications Agency. If I opened the window and looked out, I could see the I could see the Washington Monument. Okay, <laughs> that was my view. So, okay, then I retired from that. Uh, they wanted to send me to uh, to down to get the uh, what is it the advanced air force military training whatever that was uh, down in Louisiana I think or Alabama and uh, I did that or tried to do it by by correspondence so I wouldn't have to go, which would be a sort of a minus sign in my yeah. record if I did. But I was going to retire because my wife had just started her plastic surgery uh, uh, business and uh, I didn't want to move. She just started and I was just ending up yeah. essentially. Yeah. So uh, I decided to I put in my retirement paper as soon as I could so they couldn't send me anywhere <laughs> and I retired and uh, went down, uh, so I, we stayed right here. We, we bought a small house here okay. over in, uh, you know, in uh, Springfield. And then, let's see. Uh, let me, it's, it's, can we go back to Vietnam just briefly? Sure. Uh, what, what, is, what are your duties in Vietnam? What, what are you in charge of? You say com communications, but what does that yeah, mean? My job, my job was working with the Vietnamese Air Force okay. to turn over facilities to the Vietnamese Air Force. And, okay. and we were writing plans for the base commanders as to how they're going to transfer this stuff okay. to the uh, Air Force, I mean to the Vietnamese Air Force. And my boss um, was uh, he was another one of those incredibly smart. He became, he became the 
uh, chairman of the board of one of the big watch companies, and I forget which one it was, um, okay. after he retired. He was a colonel. Yeah. But that's what we did. We, write, we just wrote plans. Okay. And at one time I briefed a, a base commander as he, uh, on how to bring down, because you get, an, uh, you get a ring. If you're, if you're closing a base and giving it to somebody else, you get down to a ring where you've got self-supporting stuff. Mm -hmm. So you get rid of the cooks and put everybody on K rations. Okay. And you get rid of the male people, have them fly it in once a day. You know, that kind of thing. Yeah. And the last people there are the air police. And then you pull down the flag, take it, say thank you, salute them. Everybody gets on a C-130 right. and takes off and it's theirs. And he wasn't sure about how to do that. So I had sort of prepped him through, because okay. I'd been it with other bases, and prepped him through how to do that kind of thing. And to, so gotcha. that was that was my job. Was, right. was just trying to make sure the VNF got everything they needed. Okay. And uh, with the Vietnamese people that you you had contact with, either civilians or military, were they pretty supportive of the Americans, or had they soured on uh, us by yeah, then? Yeah, the Vietnamese, the, the 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 South Vietnamese are a different breed from the North Vietnamese. Mm. Uh, it's like Italy. If you ever live in Italy. The, North, the Northern Italians look down their nose at the Southern right. Italians. The Northern America in the, you know, the North sort of looks down yeah. at the, the ignorant South, which isn't anymore because so yeah. many of them moved down there, you know, who's yeah. there anymore? And <clears throat> all these countries in the world, it suddenly dawned on me, the North and the South, and I think there's one case where the South looks down their nose at the North, but basically it's always there's one group in the north, and I know it's for sure, when I was in Germany, because I was taking German and had two ladies that were, uh, that were teachers that were from Berlin. And we were living in, in, um, in Ramstein, mm -hmm. which is south. And you, they used to come in and talk with each other, making fun of the southern Germans. And it was a, it was really funny to listen to them chatting about their you know the things that mm -hmm. their their rented rooms or something right. that their landlady was doing and and things like this. But it's definitely definitely a a a, a, th a difference. Right. And there's a, that difference is between North and South also because North Vietnam was basically industrial, South was basically agricultural. Okay. And. Uh, when I came back on, on later on a on a uh, on a visit, we we went to uh, Thailand, Cambodia. You want to see poor? Go to Cambodia and uh, Vietnam. We went into Hanoi, stayed in the same hotel that uh, Jane Fonda stayed in when mm -hmm. she was there. Yeah, and uh, it, the internet. I think it's called the International. And you yeah. get around the north. The North Vietnamese were very friendly to us, very. I mean, they they really like they take it. They, I mean, I don't know if it, I don't think it was an act. Yeah. They were they were just maybe we were just tourists. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't know, but we saw that the North was still living in when I was there it was nineteen thirties. They have that nineteen thirties mentality. Yeah. I don't know how to explain it. And you go down south. Uh, when we when we flew down south on this vacation, I'm pulling it. We're pulling into Tonsonut, and we're pulling in. I'm look. I look, see the old revetments, the concrete revetments, stuff like that. When I was there, and we we I arrived and departed in a very long building, had all the air the air lines in mm -hmm. it, just one big long building. And I'm thinking, okay, they may probably got a little better one, maybe. We pull in. And I'm aghast. This airport at Tonsonut could be anywhere in the world. It could be. It would improve probably 90% of the airports in the United States. It was beautiful. I mean, it was first rate, first country. And so then we get out, and I'm driving. Like we're getting the bus to go down to the hotel, and I'm driving down the main line where we used to have my offices, which were old uh, French. A French military compound where okay. I had my office, and then uh, the Air Force office, the big one, was there right off the main main track. So we're going down the street. I'm looking for this. All I see are high rises, 
condos, big business. It, wow. it looks like this, honest to God, it looks like the South won the war. It really does. Because everything is new. I recognize the post office. I recognize the old presidential palace. The, the, the race track that was in front of it, that's gone. That's all just big high rises. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a, they're up in the first class area now in, in Ho Chi Minh City. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> AKA Saigon. And, uh, but the, in the South, they're really, I mean, you know, they really like Americans. Yeah. And that's what I got the two. You know, you get the two of the things you couldn't see. Right. Because when you're in a combat zone, you don't know what's going on if it's out of sight, basically. Yeah. And uh, there I got to, I can remember, if you don't mind me going back to sure. Vietnam, I can remember on, on, the, on the trip going out and seeing Black Mountain. And Black Mountain uh, is, I think, I think it's north, northwest of Saigon, up in here someplace. And we had a radio group, uh, I don't know, it was a radar outfit up there. And uh, I can remember sitting at the radio when they had to evacuate it, and they were they were being the the North Vietnamese were coming up after them this way. They're trying to get helicopters in, and I was getting all the radio traffic about what those guys were doing and try you know trying to get the yeah. hell out of there. And I don't remember if they beat down that attack or they had to actually evacuate the whole thing. But I remember listening to it, and one of the things on our bus trip out in sightseeing, I saw, the, I got pictures of the mountain that, because I'd never seen it, but now right. I know what they're doing. It's just a big mound out in the middle of the flat area. So then we went out and we saw the, we, they have a show, sort of a show and tell thing out, and we see the trap door things when they're at the Coochie tunnels. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, of course they have one where they ask you to get in we can't get in it because the, the Vietnamese are so slamming. We look like this. <laughs> you right. can get stuck. Or if a, a real small guy gets in, they put it down and stand on it for a minute. So right. the guy can get the feel for it and they let him out. And then they show, show you a 500 pound crater, which is still there. And then they show you how, how they made clothes and did things. And they showed you all their little traps with the spikes you could go in. And they weren't intended to kill them, just maim so they yeah. could get you off the battlefield. <clears throat> And then, the, but the funniest thing was, at the end of all this, they had a souvenir store, big souvenir store with all kinds of souvenirs and stuff. And the most interesting thing, you walk out back, they had a firing range. And for a dollar a round, you could shoot anything <laughs> in the story. So I cut an AK-47. I never fired one. And I go, bam. And, it, and I, the target was here, and I shot down like this, you know, down. Yeah. And it was a sighting. And, and this this guy, he must be an old VC guy, and he just looked at me, he said, he's up, up. So I finally got it up a little bit to fire, I don't know, fire ten rounds or yeah. something like that. But that was that was uh, that was interesting. But you got to see a lot of things that uh, that you really missed. Right. And and everything else is gone. I mean, the, the post office is there, that beautiful post office, and uh, but the rest of it's just sort of faded into memory right yeah what, what is your most fond memory or vivid memory i guess is a better way to put it of your time in vietnam my favorite memory? no no well it's probably a better way to say it, your most vivid memory my most vivid yeah my most vivid. what stands out the most uh well there's uh there's some, I guess, standing while I'm watching a firefight. Um, I, I had an interesting experience in the in the medical and thing. Is that, is yeah. that this is a vivid because okay, they had a one of the things they were doing during that war is they as soon as a guy got out of I guess internship, bam, you're in the military mm -hmm. and you're a, a flight surgeon or you're this or that. Right. And uh, so I, I got something growing on the side of my nose right here. And it was uh, really worried me. It hurt and all that stuff. So I go in and I see this guy. And he uh, looks at me and he says, 
Yeah, there are a lot of strange diseases here in the tropical diseases, and I think, oh Christ. <laughs> and then he says, okay, why don't you take the salve and you put on it, you rub it till it bleeds, and you know, in the shower. So, so I did that for a couple, of, come back next week kind of thing, or yeah. two weeks. Yeah, the, the ink is still running down on us, the flow. Right. Right through the right. So I go over to the, uh, so I come back two weeks, don't see him, see a new guy. He looks at me, says, wow, that, 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 I don't know. He says, I can cut it out if you want me to. I, of course, my vision was start here and go down yeah. there. And I said, no, that's okay. Anything else we can do? He says, yeah, well, there's a, <clears throat> a plastic surgeon, an army plastic surgeon. I, why don't you go over see? We'll set you up to go and see. I go, so I go over there. Do you know what it looks like for a plastic surgeon's waiting room in a combat zone? Yeah. Not pretty. And here I am with this. <laughs> and I think, oh, God. So I go in. And the first thing I do is apologize <laughs> to, the, to this doctor. He's a captain, or maybe he's a major, but he's been around a while since he's a plastic surgeon. Right. Yeah. I learned that from my wife. So anyway, he's, uh, he looks at, hmm, hmm, okay. And he says, just a minute, calls him, hey, Bob. He's down in the basement. Got a guy who has blah, blah, blah. Uh, you take care of it? Oh, uh, yeah, okay. He says, go down and see the dermatologist. He's down in the basement, okay. So go down, so go and sit in there. He goes, hmm. So he goes over, he gets a thermos. Dob. He says, this is going to hurt a little bit. It's lox or, or nitro, liquid nitrogen. Yeah. He goes, puts it on. <laughs> it hurt all right, but then everything went dead. He killed everything there. So he puts it on and says, okay, that's it. You'll be good. It'll, it won't look good for a little while. And I says, what was it? He said, oh, it was just a wart. <laughs> and that was one of my vivid memories yeah. that I like to that I like to tell. Wow! But that and uh, working with such working with my boss that finally made the J six at two stars. Uh, those are those are some of the, the yeah. highlights. Sometimes it's the things that like when you're traveling, the things that goes wrong you remember mm -hmm. and laugh about later. Right. Not the thing that ever goes smoothly. Yeah. 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 Uh, you already mentioned it briefly about your father, his military service. What, what other members of your family uh, Memories served? Memories of my father. Okay. Thank you. It's Colonel John R. Morgan. The middle name is Ross. My, uh, my nephew and I, who is John Morgan Spencer, uh, decided that the Ross came from an, from a, uh, an Indian from the 17 or 18, 1800s that uh, that did a lot for the Indian nations. Mm -hmm. uh, I could look it up, but he he was an Indian. But that's he was name was Ross. Right. You look him up. He's yeah. an interesting guy. So yes, my father was born in 1893 in a place called Minnie, Virginia. In a it was a log cabin, but I didn't know it because it had clapboard on it. Mm -hmm. and we went to visit it. Right. Once. Oh, I've got so many stories. Okay. You want to take a break anytime? Let me know. Oh, good. Okay. All right. So he was born in, in a farm. He has uh, seven brothers and sisters. He grew up in a farm. There were no cars. He was uh, mm -hmm. probably kerosene lighting. He remembers the first car that he ever saw belonged to the to the doctor in Wetzel County, West Virginia. Uh, Minnie no longer uh, uh, is there. It was just a group of houses when he, in the old days, I found a West Virginia map with Minnie on it. Mm -hmm. So I know it existed. And now it just sort of evidently yeah. went by the wayside. He, uh, he grew up, uh, I, he became an excellent horse rider as is my daughter. My, my daughter's a class A rider, and my father was too, but he was okay. never classified that. Yeah. Because uh, he grew up on the farm. And it was, uh, he went from, he was in high school there. He played left, he played left end on the football team. And he played, he played catcher on the baseball team without a mask. Mm -hmm. Which is why his nose has been broken twice. <laughs> And it's right. 
because the mask really wasn't in at the time, and besides, if you catch her using a mask, you were sort of, eh. Shit. Yeah. So he played that. He said, they only had a couple of baseballs. If you lost one on the grass, you had to stop the game until <laughs> you found it. <laughs> so he did that. Uh, he, then he went uh, two years to a uh, business school. I don't know where, I don't know, I didn't, wasn't able to track that down, but I know he did it. And then the war came along, First World War, and he decided that's what he was going to do, so he enlisted in 1917. And when he enlisted, he became a, a private in the field artillery. And that was horse artillery in those days. So he uh, he oh, he told me that he did okay. He while he was while he was uh, in the horse artillery as a private, he really became corporal. He uh, became the the regimental boxing championship in his weight it was probably about 130 pounds, 132 pounds. Okay. And uh, so he he tells me that the sergeant lined him up one day. I don't know how how much of the company or the or the, I don't know whatever. And he said the area corps is looking for pilots to fly, and uh, who wants to volunteer? At the time, the air for the air the uh, air service. I guess it was before the air service. It was a detachment or something of the uh, communications corps, mm -hmm. of the signal corps, and uh, so his buddy and and he decided they're going to do this. So they stepped forward. Nobody else did. He was the only two. So he and he he told me everything anything is better than going back to shoveling out the stables because he'd been doing that his whole life. Right. Right. <laughs> when he was growing up. Yeah. So they sent him to a, a field in Arkansas. I looked it up. I don't remember the name right offhand, but there was a. Uh, they built an aerodrome for to train pilots. He trained on the Jenny, the with the mm -hmm. JN six, I think. I have a model of it upstairs, and he uh, he became a good pilot. And at, he was on. I don't know if he was. He, he was on the the the. Uh, on the boat or on the train, but he was going to New York to get on a ship to go over to France to join the Army uh, uh, Air, Air Flame right. Division or whatever it was in those days. And uh, they, the armistice hit them. Then they had to decide what to do with the, the Army pilots. So. Some of them were given airmail duties. They did that, I think, for 18 months. To, and this was to keep them proficient in flying. And the other half, they, or the other group, they sent over to California. And one of the jobs my dad had was uh, flying uh, air patrol looking for forest fires. Now remember, when you called back in, you, it was Morse code. Mm -hmm. Morse code in the airplanes. That's the only way you could do the communication. Yeah. There's no air ground voice. So he uh, he got stationed at Presidio in in San Francisco. Okay. And the two events that I can remember that he uh, told me about, he may have been the very first pilot to fly an aerial demonstration over a packed stadium on the Fourth of July. And I think it was 1923. Mm. I think it was 23. It might have been 22, but I think it was 23. Because he was a lieutenant. All weird duties go to lieutenants because you're at the bottom of the right. line. And, uh, but he was an outstanding. I learned he was an outstanding pilot. He was, he was actually could be made a stunt pilot today. Nothing ever bothered him. He was, at, he was a fatalist and he was just never afraid of anything. Yeah. So he, and what he did, Victor, the uh, Motorola Corporation. I look at this finally looked this up. The Motorola Motorola Corporation put an air ground radio 
into his, his, his DH-4, I think it was a DH-4, had to be, put it in his DH-4. So when he flew over the, the stadium, mm -hmm. packed, I don't know, 40, 50, 60,000 people, I don't know how big the stadiums were in those days, but it was packed, flew over it, he, he, he would tell them what he was going to do, he'd announce it down. Now I don't know whether they announced it to some guy down there with a the headset yeah. and he said he's got, Lieutenant Morgan is going to do this or what. But, or whether they hooked him directly into the speakers and he would tell them, that, uh, it must have been, okay, this is a barrel roll. He'd go over like this, okay. This is a stall, you know. Yeah. This is a uh, Emelman, you know, and then come around, you know, all those things. That, whatever it was, he could do it, and he did it over the, sta over the stadium. Yeah, Which wow. wouldn't be allowed to do Yeah. I have, and that was recorded in the San Francisco newspaper, which I have the copy of somewhere. Mm. And uh, I have never found anything because I've gone on the uh, AI and asked about it. Nobody knows anything mm -hmm. earlier. Wow. So I thought that was sort of a, a yeah. neat thing for him to do. Uh, while he was there, he uh, he told me he they if you ever looked in the instruments of a DH four, it's there's not much much. He flew when he was doing uh, uh, firefighting coverage, flying over. Uh, he flew into a cloud bank or something. He says he got dis disoriented. He spun out and he spun into a valley hmm. with mountains on either side of him. So that was sort of iffy, you know, kind of flying in those days. Yeah. And uh, I mean, oh, there's another one that was in the newspaper. Daring Aviator was one of the way they put it. He was flying over San Francisco, I guess somewhere around the Presidio, and his engine quit, which is not unlikely in a DH-4. Mm -hmm. So he takes it down, dead sticks it into a park, gets out, fixes it, takes off. And I don't know how he did that with the prop, because I, I guess he could do it, he could prop it and then run in or, you know, and yeah. jump in it while it was rolling. And then he, he took off, flew around, and it quit again. He came down, landed again, got in, fixed it, and took off, and went back to base. That was in the newspaper, daring wow. yeah. <laughs> wow. which I thought was pretty. Yeah. Those are the two things I remember from from his from his uh, San Francisco days. Then he got transferred down to he got transferred down to uh, San Diego, mm -hmm. an air base down in San Diego. Okay, interesting thing there. One that that I remember. I remember two quotes from this, absolute quotes. Uh, flying was still new, no airlines and all that kind of stuff, uh, dead barnstormers and things like that, but nobody was really, I think I was read something like 98% of something of the, of the population in those days had never been up in an airplane. So he was, uh, he was standing around I guess one day, I can fill in this, I pretty much know him what, what happened. And they said, Lieutenant Morgan, uh, we have a, uh, a uh, reporter coming out from one newspaper, San Diego. I want you to take him up and show him what he wants to know what flying is all about. So he mm -hmm. comes out. And I can see my dad very patiently because he taught school before he graduated from school. He taught high school before he graduated from high school. Okay. I guess he was teaching middle school and he was a senior oh, okay. and a junior. He, I learned later, you know, like parents, I learned later my dad was a genius. He got a head of 140 IQ to do what he did. Anyway, so anyway, so he goes out, and the reporter's out there, and my dad, you know, shows him the, the, all, why the, uh, the wings are like mm -hmm. this, and the thing, the flap, not no flaps, I mean the ailerons, and the, and the rudder, and all the parts of the airplane, and all blah, blah, blah. And he went all through this with him, got in, explained the instruments to him, and he says, okay, get in. He got in up front. Pilots usually stay in the back, I think. That's my surmise yeah. also. All right, anyway, he gets up, he gives him the airline flight. Uh, flies over San Diego, uh, comes down and lands. Okay, they get out. My dad. Now, this is not a quote. Uh, he probably said, how do you like it? Any questions, blah, blah. The guy says, quote, is that all there is to it?" Unquote. My dad, quote, get back in, 
unquote. <laughs> he must have torn almost torn the wings off of that airplane because he said he said when he came back in they were rolling up to the hangar. He the guy was already getting out and running behind and <laughs> was, before they even stopped he jumped off and was behind the hangar throwing up. Wow. I looked for an article. <laughs> I never found it. I know somewhere in there yeah. there's there, that article on that. Oh yeah. Said, probably it was a very nice flight. Lieutenant Morgan is a very nice pilot. Right. <laughs> something, like this. something like that. But anyway, that was something yeah. I remember from that one. Yeah, wow. The other one is a uh, interesting one uh, where he created an international incident. He was taking, I think they're 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 flying three sergeants in those days. Sergeants flew. They had three sergeants, and my dad, a lieutenant, was taking a flight from San Diego to some place in Arizona. I'm pretty sure it was Arizona. Mm -hmm. So. He takes off, and he, he briefs them on what to do, because they're going right along the Mexican border. So he takes off, they fly along the Mexican border, and then they hit a very large thunderstorm. I mean, wide and big. The only way around it to get to where you're going is they detoured around. It. Now, I don't know how close he was, or but he was chaperoning them, but they moved over somewhat, in, not very much, into mm -hmm. Mexico and then landed. Next thing he knows is what happened was somebody on the ground got the tail numbers. They went to the Mexican, head of the Mexican army. He went to their, to their, uh, their the people that run the, the diplomatic people. I guess uh, maybe it was our embassy. I guess I, I guess they went to our mm -hmm. embassy in Mexico. They went to the State Department in the United States. The State Department went to the War Office. The War Office sent a thing down, you know, saying right. what's going on here, reprimand them, whatever. <laughs> now the guy I did learn the guy that was running things then was a cavalry officer, mm. which understood zero about flying. Right. All he knew is they went over into Mexico, so. He sends down a letter of reprimand to Lieutenant Morgan, <clears throat> and saying you didn't instruct your guys and blah blah all this kind of stuff. So all of the sergeants wrote letters saying that they were they were uh, I saw I think I saw some of these that that they were well briefed they knew what was going on blah blah and he attached it to his rebuttal and sent it back up to the cavalry officer didn't move the cattle wheels. <laughs> <laughs> so it stayed in his right. I think it stayed in his file for a year or something like that. But that was that was his international yeah. incident. Wow. Uh, I'm trying to think if anything else happened while he was at, while he was there. And I think it was at that point he was moved, he went to San Antonio, Texas. And I think he was at Kelly Air Force Base, and they were training pilots, or maybe it was Randolph Field at that time mm -hmm. also. And during his time, when I was in the Pentagon, I can remember somewhere on one of those walls, they had something that was maybe 15 feet, 10 feet by 4 feet or something of a, of a picture mm -hmm. of the reviewing stand at Kelly Air Force Base, uh, Kelly, uh, the Kelly. Field, yeah, and those I keep getting mixed up. Kelly Field in those days, and it shows the the uh, reviewing stand. Nineteen twenty-eight. Wow. And I'm thinking, hmm. So I go down. And I start looking at everybody on it, and lo and behold, the last guy on the end that was my father. It couldn't have been anybody else. I know him too well. How he looked, right. how he stood, and everything like that. And uh, I would swear to it that it was him on there. And I saw him in the Pentagon. I wanted to go and get a picture of it from the Air Force uh, Photographic Service, but I never did. Yeah. So anyway, uh, he was he was a Kelly. He was I think he, he taught uh, the the a, a primary, and then he taught advanced, and then he he moved up to different. He was, became a stage commander. That was either primary or advanced, I think that's a stage, 
and he became a commander of that, and then he moved up as a lieutenant colonel. It still boggles my mind that in the 30s, probably 1937, 38, something like that, as a, as a lieutenant colonel, he became director of flying training mm. and education for the Army Air Corps. Wow. That's a two-star general yeah. job now. So anyway, he uh, moved it, finally moved into that position, and that's, that's when the, uh, that lieutenant general came in and saved me to go to the uh, Research and Development Command uh, was, was there. And, it, and he, he worked up, and one of the things he always mentioned was the Air, Air Corps expansion. And the Air Corps expansion was important because the more I read about it, everyone in the military knew we were going to war except a handful of right. people trying to keep us out of it. They all knew we were going. And so he, um, he got a letter. This is, this is really something that I really followed up on. He got a letter from General Arnold, who at the time I think was a major general who headed up the Army Air Corps. Mm -hmm. They had known each other because he was in before my dad, but for all those years, uh, he knew my dad, and my dad knew General Arnold. And he sent a letter to my dad saying, oh no, let's, I got that backwards. My dad sent a letter to him as director of flying training, said we cannot do the number of people we need by just using Randolph Field and Kelly Field to produce the number of pilots we need. We're going to have to use civilian contract schools. I got that in the, in the record, hmm. in, the, in the Air Force official records, or the Army Air Corps official yeah. records from 1938, I think. And so he sent them that letter. Not shortly thereafter, he got a letter from General Arnold saying, come up and report into my staff as fast as you can, essentially, by the fastest military transportation. And he did. Now what happened was, and this is in the official record, General Arnold's staff did not want any civilian contract pilots teaching military pilots because they thought they would contaminate them right. or something and they would not be the, the the military way of doing things. My dad knew better and so he uh, he asked oh he went he had to go up to uh, the, to the uh, war office the Pentagon wasn't built at the time and brief Arnold and so Arnold's whole staff was against him, so you can you realize the reception he got. Yeah. So we went and did it, and shortly thereafter Arnold announced to the world that we were going to start using civilian contract <laughs> pilots. I guess he got all the credit for it. <laughs> I mean, that's a general. That, that's, 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 that's the way it goes. Right. So. He, he went up in a B-18, and the reason I know that is, is because when I was, my mother took us down to, onto the flight line in our private car, which she could do because my mm. dad was yeah. what he was, <laughs> to meet my dad who came, who flew it back from, from Washington. That B-18, Bolo, fastest airplane <laughs> in the service that he get in a short time. So anyway. Uh, I can remember the guy that was on the flight line with my mom said, told me, and I, let's see, God, I couldn't have been with three, three and a half, something like that. But I remember, it's vivid. Mm -hmm. He said, you want to go see the air, see your dad in the airplane? I said, yeah. So he took me over. You can, B-18s can be configured in different ways. And they, they did. For after, some, after a while, they configured it. Some of them were like transport. They had, they had seats, okay. and I can remember he put me in there, and I walked about halfway up the line, and I remember my dad was in the left seat, pilot seat, 
and he turned around and he said, hello, Donald. And I looked at him. He was out of context because I only knew him at home. Right. And I turned, <laughs> I turned around, ran back down. He got me up. I ran back to see my, to my mother. But I, that, I, that he was coming back from uh, he was coming back from Washington. Yeah. And that's how why I know he went to wow. the Yeah. Wow. So after that, <clears throat> he uh, he went down to he was he had his choice. After he had he had completed getting the pilot system up and running, so we're going to have enough pilots for World War II. In 1941, they they had asked him, "What do you want to do?" Arnold asked him if he wanted to come up to to Washington and be on his staff. Of course, I don't know how that go over with his staff, but and my dad said, "No, I'd like to go down to Harlingen, Texas." and build a base and be the first commander. Now, my dad's philosophy, something like Julius Caesar's, it's better to be the first man in a small Iberian village than the second man in Rome. Mm -hmm. Sort of my father's philosophy. And I, I, okay, so he, went, he, was he was assigned down there. And he built the base, I can remember, his first office, I have pictures of his first office, it was just a, a shed or something. It was on the on the, this field, all this acreage. The acreage had been given to the Air Corps for the mm -hmm. military's sake, both for, for you know, being uh, patriotic, and second, because it always brings a lot of money. Right, out. right. So he, uh, he, built, he built the post, and this, his first office, he had to borrow furniture. He didn't even have a, something to sit on. He had all, found a desk and this kind of stuff. I have a picture of him in it. No wall boarding, no nothing, just bare walls mm -hmm. like an old army barracks. And so he built the, built the, uh, the base, started the, the first gunnery school, <coughs> which sort of gave the other gunnery schools a way to, you know. Uh, it's a model. Pro model themselves, yeah. 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 Um, he did. Let's see. While he was there, if now that I'm thinking of it, uh, uh, he had he had a movie, uh, Pine, P Pine Productions, Pine and something. I don't remember the other name of the movie. People came down and said they want to make a a uh, picture about uh, the gunnery people mm -hmm. because people don't realize that in Europe. Uh, aerial gunners, we lost more aerial gunners than we did Marines in World War II. Yeah. Because every time a B-17 went down, you know, you wouldn't have had a bunch of gunners with it. Yep. So they wanted to do, they wanted to do, a, so they made a picture called uh, Aerial Gunner. It was a pop boiler, but it was one of the big sellers of 43, I think. Okay. And uh, it, uh, one of the most important things about it, it shows you the different phases of how they made an aerial gunner, and you know they they mm -hmm. come out and they show how they were working stuff, and it was uh, you know like the the top turret or the turret, and they'd pull things across, and you had to follow it and lead it, and yeah. do it at different speeds and things like that. And it was it was an interesting movie. I mean, it, I tried to get one. I tried to get a copy of it because my dad opened it. Okay. He was sitting at his desk and he said, talked about aerial gunners, the need for them, and blah, 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 and all this. But when they did, when they put it on TV, they cut that out. Uh, so I lost that. Although somewhere I'm sure it's available. Right. With my dad then yeah. opening. And then, uh, let's see, what else is going on down there? Uh, let's see. Can we take a break a minute? Sure. Let's take a break. Sure. And uh, let me get my. Sure, we're doing. We're recording. Okay. Okay, we're back. Okay, um, you were saying. <laughs> one of one of the things that uh, he did when he was in Harlingen, he did more than just the aerial gunnery things. Uh, his uh, Legion of Merit at the time contained all kinds of things that he did there. That uh, well, I sent that to the uh, well. I'll get to that later at the end. 
One of the things that uh, he did was he used the WASPs, Women's Air Service Pilots. Mm -hmm. He really believed that uh, women, women could uh, fully perform in the uh, aerospace area. And uh, I found a book once, and I still have it. It, it has a, a little short bit on, on uh, my father, Colonel Morgan, and it, it uh, says, he said, quote, a woman can do anything on the flight line that a man can do, mm -hmm. And I thought that was very progressive, yeah. particularly yeah. from 1943. Or yeah, absolutely. Like so he uh, he he did much more. Uh, he he did things like he was working with B twenty four pilots, uh, and uh, there's a lot of, of uh, airplanes coming through to be ferried places, and uh, it was just it was an interesting times. So mm -hmm. My uh, brother and sister both graduated. Actually, my sister graduated from Harlingen. My brother went up halfway through Harlingen High and then went to, when we moved to Keesler Air Force Base, he wanted to get into uh, Texas Tech. And uh, they wouldn't let him in because he was an out of state student. Mm. So that's the way it goes. Yep. So we had to go to West Point instead. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So anyway, after uh, after he uh, the war was over, he was reass uh, Colonel Morgan was reassigned to Keesler Air Force Base, and at that time it was an air sea rescue. And one of the comments I remember from my dad that said that flying a PBY was the noisiest plane he'd ever flown, and you can see why if you ever look at a PBY, mm -hmm. it's where the props are right. compared to pilots. Yeah. Uh, set. So uh, while he was there, um, he Pine Thomas. That's those are the producers. Pine Thomas came down, and they did the, a very successful show in Harlem, John Montgomery. So they went, They did a a, sh a show that was v probably very forgettable on uh, on Air Sea Rescue, and it was called Seven Were Saved. Mm. And I don't think I've ever even seen the movie. It went into the no, fence very quickly, no. but they did the movie there anyway. And and uh, so from there, uh, because General, or I guess Secretary of State Marshall, was over in uh, China at the behest of President Truman mm -hmm. to try and make peace between the communists and uh, the Nationalists, that he called on uh, my dad to become the, I think, I'm not sure what his uh, job was. Uh, I, I think it, it may have been uh, having to do with something with the, uh, with supplies and things, you know, mm -hmm. to, to support the group. Mm -hmm. uh, he wasn't directly in negotiations. Well, he couldn't have been because nobody was but General yeah. Marshall. So he's, he was there for a long time, and that's when I can remember after that little episode, or, or he was there, and he uh, finally, when Marshall's ended and just left, then my dad was reassigned to uh, reassigned to Nagoya, Japan, as Inspector General for the Fifth Air Force. So as he... Uh, Yeah, he moved out, and I'm trying to think of, uh, oh, the one thing he said, that's what I was trying to think of. The one thing he said was, you can't negotiate with a communist. Because right. he would tell me about how the communists there would steal jeeps, and they would come to negotiations without even painting over <laughs> the identification <laughs> numbers. <laughs> and he said, you couldn't do anything about it. Right. And so that sort of rankled some people, but there was nothing you could really do. So he says you can't negotiate with communists. And he's always held that belief. And mm -hmm. after seeing what's going on, I can believe it. Yeah. They only they either win or they don't negotiate. So anyway, after that, 
uh, he went to Nagoya, Japan, under General Wolf, who was commander of the Fifth Air Force, and he became the IG. Um, one thing I can remember there, on my perceptions, was seeing the uh, was seeing the Mitsubishi plant that made Mitsubishi airplanes mm -hmm. for the war, just acres and acres of twisted steel. I mean, it was just bomb flat. Wow. And interestingly enough, while we're there um, at my dad's behest, we, we stayed in the Kanko Hotel for nine months until they gave him a, a house. And he was this, he may have been the second ranking or the third ranking person in, in the Air Force at the time. So they gave him the second largest house at the time. He belonged to an antique dealer. And the antique dealer uh, had three shop, four shops, one in Nagoya, one in Tokyo, one in Kyoto, and I think he had another one in Yokohama. And he gave my dad a, and I don't know, a, a, a uh, antique scroll. I still haven't had it looked at by the Japanese to see what it really is, yeah. but it's hanging in the living room. Wow. <laughs> but I'm going to do that. I take yeah. very good care of that. And uh, anyway, we, we moved into Nagoya. Uh, my dad, because of his place in the in the hierarchy, the Japanese government provided us with two maids, Kimiko and Ayako, wow. and a chauffeur for my dad. That was Tony Watanabe, and we had a cook, and we had a gardener, much to the delight of my mom. <laughs> 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 so we lived in a very nice home, and. Uh, I, these are just things I forgot when I was yeah. telling my, my viewpoint. Uh, every room had a buzzer in it, and a little thing came down in the uh, kitchen, so they okay. came out, and uh, that was nice. My mother warned me not to use it, <laughs> 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 which I think I only did once for tea and tea. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, uh, I can remember while we were there that he, in his job, he had to get to go to work, and it was May Day, and they had big communist parades right. in Japan at the time. And my dad had an open Jeep. He had bought an open Jeep for $600 at, after the war, had a shrapnel hole in it. Mm. And, but that's what we rode around with in the winter, was an open Jeep. And he, uh, I can remember one day he had a shoulder holster, and he said they, they the uh, chief of police, or the provost marshal, said, take your 45, and if anybody tries to get to you, molest you or anything, kill them, and we'll take care of it. So he went out with a shoulder holster, and being an old country boy, I'm sure he yeah. would have used it. Wow. So uh, that was one interesting thing while we were there. And then he... Uh, to replace that, he bought a 1948 G, uh, Ford four-door. And at the time we were there, the Japanese, and I've seen this, even the bit like the limos, I saw one parked once, we were going to Kyoto, and I saw it parked, and the driver got out and he fed wood into the back, because mm -hmm. they were using the fumes to run it. Mm. Burning fumes? Wow. Or something. Yeah. And that's how they got around. Now, when we got it, we had our, one of, one of our, our drivers named Suzuki. You'd have thought we'd had a Rolls Royce Silver Ghost. I mean, he kept flowers in it. <laughs> and uh, he, would, he was top dog on the yeah. cars. When he'd, take, he'd take us someplace sometimes. But they also had a nice system there where uh, they had Jeep drivers. And mm -hmm. if I was downtown, even as a kid, I'd run all over the place. Yeah. Even as a kid, I could I could get in the Jeep and say, Rokuchu Hachiban, which means house number 48. And he'd take me home. Yeah, no, wow. It didn't cost anything. And we used uh, uh, currency, the, the uh, occupation currency, mm -hmm. that so you, they couldn't reprint it or something. They changed it all the time. Yeah, like script. So, my dad, uh, he wasn't the kind, he, he didn't really like being an IG. 
you know, it's one of the, we're here to help you. Right. Uh, we're glad to see you kind of thing. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, both know you're yeah. lying. Yeah. So he's, that wasn't his style. But uh, anyway, he got through it. And General Wolf liked him enough, so he took him to uh, Wright Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio. And he was there. And then finally he got to the point where he wanted, oh, he also, uh, right after the war, he also made Brigadier General. He was on the list, I saw mm -hmm. the list. But because everything was going down, they, he, did, he never was able to pin him on, but he, okay. made the, he made the list. Yeah. And then, um, I don't, can't think of anything else that was especially interesting. I said it, already did it from my view. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, he was ready to retire, so they said, where do you want to go? You can be a CEO of the base. And he went down to San Angelo, Texas. And I don't remember, he was on a, a committee in the 30s that went around picking out bases. Mm -hmm. And uh, he ran it, uh, as far as I know. And he, I don't know if he picked San Angelo or not, but it may have been. Uh, he right. Picked, you never know. So anyway, uh, he went down and became commander. And the interesting thing there, he met up with his old buddy from high school who used to play right end on the football team when he was playing left end. Okay. I thought that was sort of yeah. the background to be able to do it. Yeah. He was an oil an oilman. And uh, interesting, one of the big oil fields that he that this that this guy had uh, just missed. He, d he knew it was there, and he had drilled a couple, two or three wells just outside of this mm. huge oil field. Somebody else did right into it uh. and, and got the, got it. So, but it was it was nice. I met my best friend there. Oh, there's another one going back to me. I met my best friend there, Roger Spencer, and uh, he he became a, a border patrolman, a popular border patrolman if, if you can believe it, because he had a wicked sense of humor. Mm -hmm. And even the people who collected liked him for some some reason. And he wore cowboy boots. I always have to tell this because my best friend's cowboy boots were something else. They were stove pipes. Hot. They were basically red with mm. green foxing. Foxing's that fancy stuff on the, on them. Okay. Yeah, and yeah. Green. He had ears on them. Those are the 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 flaps that come down on the side that you can use. They had his initials in white calf. I <laughs> wow. mean, you could hear him coming a mile away. Plus, they had crepe heels, uh, crepe soles with a walking heel. Mm -hmm. Hmm. It was amazing. I never seen him like it. Anyway, that was my best friend. We learned to drive together, and uh, I won a trophy in drag racing. I got the 50 Mercury when my, my dad got a, my 52. Uh, Cadillac. We, they let me drive it when yeah. I was 16 and I just started to drive it. And I got out to the races with it. Wow. And so he was there as my mechanic, so to speak. Anyway, that's a little sidelight. But uh, we, he got the, got the, oh, let's see, while he was there, uh, there was a German in a flying wing glider went all the way I don't know where he started, but he, he set a world's record and he happened to be over West Texas and he had to land it for some reason. He's running out of mm -hmm. thermals, I guess. And he land, they gave him permission. I don't know if my dad, I, 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 th I think what happened was they gave him permission and tell my dad, we just gave this guy permission. Right. It was okay, my dad would give him permission anyway. Yeah. And I got up to go out and see this guy, shake hands with him and uh, meet him. Hmm. It was a, a German, uh, pilot and I, I guess he was a uh, some kind of professor that was, okay you know testing these things right out. but he took me out to see that uh, one time he took me out we uh, it was a British officer flying an f-89 scorpion back to Britain and the guy took off and evidently, for some reason, went upside down just off the end of the runway and plowed in. And he took me out to see the remains of that. And then he took me to, I can remember the RAF officer who came in, 
had a box with his remains in it, and we went down to base operations. He took me down there in 16, 17, and the guy was standing there with the box, and I knew, and we knew what it was, and he just I, he couldn't shake hands. I just yeah. said, thank you. My dad chatted with him a few minutes, and then he left to get on the airplane to go back to Britain. Mm. Remember that. Um, oh, one of the things, when we was at Harlingen, this is something that always, I never want to forget. Um, you ever heard of the Memphis Bell? Mm -hmm. Memphis Bell, after they did their 20 missions, did a tour of right. the United States. Right. They came to Harlingen. He took me down. I got to meet the crew of the Memphis Bell. Wow. And the, the, the pilot's name was Major Morgan. Hmm. Okay. Sort of a coincidence. Yeah. I don't know if we're related or not, yeah. but uh, yeah. And uh, we've got to go meet the crew. Which we, and I have, I have a, a photograph of the Memphis Bell with with his signature, and the navigator signature on it. Mm. That's a sort of sort of cool. Yeah, that is very cool. And then, uh, oh, getting back to where were we? Uh, we're back to San Angelo. Yeah. And Goodfellow Air Force Base. Yeah, I can't think of anything else there. That I know we, I know he did other things there that were, were pretty nice. He got along well with everybody. And uh, he knew Lyndon Johnson. Of course, he was in the the uh, of uh, of the San Angelo area. He was always in the hierarchy. So. Mm -hmm. Got, and uh, Lynn Johnson was in the Senate, he'd come through and my dad would talk to him. Yeah. yeah. And just as a coincidence, Lyndon Johnson is the one who appointed me to the West Point. However, I would like to put in, I also made it on a presidential. <laughs> they, <laughs> they said, we're not giving you the presidential because that leaves a slot, because that's competitive. That leaves yeah. a slot for somebody else. Okay. So you have, you have to take Lyndon Johnson's. I said, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, oh, he also knew, uh, he also knew the uh, owner of the King Ranch. They used to go up there for hunting, I guess. Right. I don't know what it was. Oh, my dad, he used to get turkeys all the time for Thanksgiving. They all went to the mess hall. And he used to take me in there, too. We'd go to the mess hall for, <laughs> thir for uh, a Thanksgiving dinner. Yeah, wow. And... So that's all I can think of right now. Oh, I used to, let's see, that was there. I used to set pins. My buddy, they had the old manual stuff for setting pins and bowling. Mm -hmm. I did that a while. It, it's interesting because those pins go by your ear once in a while. Right. <laughs> so, <laughs> like a combat yeah. thing back there. <clears throat> so I think that's all I have right now okay. for my father and Goodfellow Air Force Base. He retired from there, and then he went back down to Harlingen, Texas, and bought an orchard of uh, Texas red blush grapefruit. I think it's called Rio Rio blush or something like mm -hmm. that. Now I just ordered some from the very people that used to take care of his orchard, and so we found found a nice little place, one one level. Uh, he had all kinds of, he planted orange trees and banana, whatever. He planted all mm -hmm. that stuff. Had avocados up front. We had avocados that was coming out of our ears. <laughs> and, uh, but, and the grapefruit was, is superb. Right. And I would, I would suggest you try, if you ever had, had and haven't had any that lower Rio Grande Valley grapefruit, it is extra but good. Yeah. Better than Florida's, I have to say. Yeah. Yes, sir, but. So anyway, uh, he was there only one oh one one time he was going. We were looking at how he was looking at houses in an arroyo, and uh, it was actually a, a, it had a, a a couch that set about you could seat thirty two people on it. it. Just sort of went. It was a it was a kind of uh, party house or something. 
And then he got a, this other one, which was much better, because mm -hmm. I, was, I, was, I had a vote in those days, even though I was only 18 or 17. And uh, I said, I think it's better up here, which is good, because that hurricane come through, and my mother was alone with him, and the water came up, flooded that house, and okay. came up within half a mile or quarter mile of, of this house, yeah. of the one they were in. But he did. He did. Uh, he didn't do so well in later years. He had, he was a smoker. Yeah. You know, he started World War One. Mm -hmm. Started smoking Camels, Luckies, the heavy stuff. Yep. And he smoked it. He got emphysema. And in 1969, he passed away from emphysema. Yeah. And uh, it was just something. I just. It was just terrible. Uh, anyway, yeah, and I think oh, uh, since then I put in his the information the West Virginia Aviation Hall of Fame. The first time they looked at it, they didn't think it was complete because I, I didn't know what to put in the things. Yeah, I'm an engineer, not a writer. <laughs> right. And I finally, what I did, I found I found his uh, Legion of Merit. That's three pages long. Yeah. Wow. And uh, I just sent that, and they said once they saw that, it was no problem. Yeah. Uh, I would say something about the Texas Aviation Hall of Fame, but I won't. Not on record. Yeah. Although I should. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, that's about. Oh, he's uh, Colonel Morgan is a descendant of Colonel Morgan Morgan. Uh, from uh, the frontier, from the days of of the revolution. As a matter of fact, his descendants, and down to me, and down to my son, were members of the uh, uh, Sons of the Revolution, Sons of the American right. Revolution. Right. Okay. And so that means my father could have been in the Sons of the American Revolution too. And Morgan Morgan was. Uh, Born in 1688 in Wales, and he died in 1766. Uh, I did some research on him, which is, makes it interesting, uh, and I, I, I can't prove because I've been to the old family estate in Wales. Yeah. And they had a chart on the wall, and I could see where everybody was. But they, but Morgan Morgan was. The, and I'm not sure. I, I, I'm not sure whether he's the brother or the uncle. No, he couldn't have been the uncle. Had to, he had to been in the line. Um, he, I think he was the brother of Henry Morgan, the pirate. Right. Wow. If I'm not mistaken, which makes Henry my uncle. Yeah. <laughs> wow. A ways back. Yeah, way yeah. back. But, uh, Very cool. but you know, it's things like that with the family. Cause the family yeah. has a long, long yeah, history sounds like working it. in the yeah, it sounds like in the whole thing. Wow. So I was very proud of uh, that. I was, I was, my father was my father. Yeah, sounds and I like have it. that thing to look yeah, up to. Sounds like it. And if I think of anything else, I'll let you know. All right, well, that's a great story. Um, huh? That that's a great story. Fascinating story about your oh, dad and We're your service. Done. Okay. We're going to my brother. Okay. Because we're still in the military. My brother. My brother is uh, Lieutenant Colonel John R. Morgan, Jr. And uh, he he went with us to he went with us to Japan, where he spent a year, and uh, in college there, the American College. And then at eighteen, my dad got him a. And had a, got an appointment mm -hmm. for him to West Point. So we sent him. We I still remember we left from he left from Yokohama. My brother-in-law, who was a major in the medical corps and Air Force flight surgeon, my mother and I and my brother, and we put him on a ship to go from Yokohama. It stopped in the Philippines and they went to San Francisco. From there, he has to take a train across the United States to West Point, and then he was to sign in 
to a uh, to a prep school where he spent a year at prep school. He didn't trust me. Mm -hmm. He made I went to prep school for a year or two, <laughs> but uh, he just wanted to make sure we got yeah. the first year. Yeah. So uh, after prep school, he went to West Point, uh, and he he uh, graduated pretty high in his class in, 19, in 1952. Went into the Air Force, and uh, he. I'm a little hazy on it, but he went into nuclear weapons, into the nuclear business. And because in the end, the only place he could, he could be assigned to the Atomic Energy Commission and the Air Force atomic weapons thing in, in, uh, in the Pentagon or in the Air Force, mm -hmm. or in the Washington area, or to Sandia Base at, in uh, uh, Al Albuquerque, New Mexico. Okay. And if he traveled anywhere, he had to go on a, a uh, diplomatic passport. So he could put one together, take one apart, <laughs> and knew every, you know knew all that stuff. Yeah. So he was in it a long time. He uh, unfortunately died before he was fifty. My mother said it was because of all the atomic tests he went yeah. through and, and the atomic tests. In, in New Mexico, yeah, probably. where he got something, they think it was an aneurysm. His wife at the time was a, was a, in, uh, I, I'm not sure whether she was in the, in the military at the time or not, but she, she got a, uh, she got a degree in gastroenterology. I just saw somebody walk by. Yeah, the dog. Gastroenterology. She joined the army after my, after she became a physician, mm -hmm. and uh, spent 20 years in. And uh, she's buried in the Santa Fe, New Mexico, uh, national okay. uh, cemetery with my brother. Which the interesting thing is, she was in the military. I'm sure my brother <laughs> appreciated this. My brother passed away. We couldn't find this. What is it? DD 412? DD 214? DD 214. Yeah, that's yep. right. To get him in the cemetery. So he went into the cemetery as her dependent, as her <laughs> husband. <laughs> when, all, when he at the time yeah. outranked her. So now they're in there. It's, it's sort of cute. I, I got to chuckle over that one. But at least they're together. Yeah. That's the main thing. Yeah. And, uh, so that was that was my brother's essential. He he taught me to love Alfa Romeos. He had an Alfa Romeo, a spider, when mm -hmm. I came back from Vietnam was signed here. I stayed with him for a month or so right. until I got a place. And uh, my first car I bought here was an Alfa Romeo spider, which I didn't know you really should have an Italian mechanic sitting in the back at all times. Right. <laughs> My wife calls it a lawn ornament. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I had two of those, and uh, that was in sports cars. Then I got three R two RX sevens. Oh, in the meantime, a, a, a Mustang, and now I want a uh, Mitsubishi three thousand GT. Okay. Which I wanted to visit the factory when I go over there at the end of September of twenty three go over at the end of September and see what they did with it. But I don't, we looked around and I don't know if the one I'm looking at is the same one. It, anyway, it's a new one, they just built right. it in the ground up. Right. But yeah, that, was, that was something. So he's the one that got me into sports cars. Yeah. And I still have the Mitsubishi. I'm never given that, I yeah. have to give it to somebody. And so my brother uh, had a lot of influence on me. Yeah. When I met my, uh, Carol, my wife, uh, for the first time I went over to meet her, I just want, you know, uh, this lady that I said, this Air Force major, a captain that was so brilliant, she's the one that knew her. Mm -hmm. and, and when I came back to Vietnam, I said, you should meet her. She's, she's a nice lady. Yeah. And so I, I was going to go over. I had red hair at the time, would you believe it? <laughs> and uh, my sister in law, the, the physician, I put on a white. To, you know the usual yeah. M1A1 stuff, 
And she says, you can't do that. And so she got me out, my brother about the same size, she put me in a pink shirt with red hair, you know, and then some kind of tie, I don't know what it was. And I went over to meet her. And my wife thought that was strange <laughs> when she first met me. She right. met me at the door with her coat on, yeah. and ready to go, because she knew about Air Force guys from Judy, because Judy had come, the, my bright gal had come back and lived with her after she got out of the Air Force, was still hanging around with some of the Air Force guys. And they were all big drinkers, yeah. and partiers, yeah. and stuff like that. So she thought that's what I was coming. So Judy had was the right. passport right. to see her. And then she realized that was really so <laughs> spoiled. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, anyway, um, my brother, he was a great guy. He was smart. He was intelligent. He's in one of the most smart. I, I rate things, mm -hmm. and you go from smart to intelligent to wise. Wise at the top of the heap. Yeah. And he, uh, he was, he was a, an intelligent guy. I really liked him. He was cool. So that's about yeah. all I have for my brother. Now, going on to my brother-in-law. Um, I'll do the short version of one of my brother-in-laws. Mm -hmm. uh, that was the one my, I went to my sister's wedding in 1942 or three, somewhere in there, in Galveston, Texas. She was in nursing school. My ex-brother-in-law was in, was in medical school, nurse, doctor, got together, married. And so they moved to Waco, Texas. He was a hard worker though. He, they, went, they lived in Mule Shoe, Texas for a while. And uh, this involves my sister, so I guess it's okay. He, we, he lived in Muleshoe, Texas, and it almost killed him because of the distances mm -hmm. and the fact that he did all house calls and the fact that he was getting paid in corn and pigs and chickens yeah. and all that stuff out in West Texas. And so he finally gave that, gave that up. They moved into Waco. And my sister, after my kids were in school, I mean, not got kids. One, my nephews were in school. She had two boys. Um, she became an associate professor of geology at Baylor, and uh, so at that time, she, had, you know, enough is enough. She divorced <laughs> my my ex brother-in-law, who used to be a uh, flight surgeon, and she married a Ph.D geologist who had his own history record of being, having a father, Diamond Genis, uh, in the Arctic. And my, that brother-in-law, my sister Jean, he uh, <coughs> was on one of the first surveys across Canada to really get a look at all the geology of Canada. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was, used to talk about living out in the wilderness with a cook who was an Eskimo and another helper and they were, they were just going out and making a written record right across right across Canada. Plus there's a there's a complete in the in the National Museum in Ottawa there's a complete room named for Diamond Genis, my brother in law's father. Okay. So we got some history going in different yeah. directions. Uh, but my brother in law passed away last year and my sister passed away a couple of years ago and so anyway uh, that's someone from my, from my uh, brother-in-law who was a flight surgeon he had a problem he uh, he hit the uh, he had a motorcycle went into a ditch hit his head mm. uh, he went a little bit weird after yeah that. yeah all right, and my next brother-in-law, he married my oldest sister, um, and uh, Alma was 18, just like my my sister Jane to get married. Mm -hmm. Alma, we were at uh, Randolph Field, and uh, Mac is M. C. Rowan, or Rowan, either way. Uh, and we'll call him Mac. And Mac came through flight training 
and then had the chutzpah to start dating the daughter <laughs> of the director of flying training. And my dad approved of him. He was a nice guy. He's smart. Yeah. And uh, so he he got through pilot training. Was in I think Arizona. He says, I want to marry you now before I go anywhere. She accepted. And so my parents put her on a train to go out there. They got married. And they, God, they were 45, 50 years married. And uh, they're both buried in uh, the Denver National Cemetery in Denver. And so his life was... Uh, after he got after he uh, got through flight training, he uh, as a lieutenant he went out and uh, learned to fly B 24s or B 17s. He was a B 17, learned to be a B 17 pilot. He was doing a training mission over somewhere in California. Something went went south, and he had to bail out. Mm -hmm. And when he bailed out, he hit his he hip on the horizontal stabilizer. And he came down, he was in the mountains for about three days before they found him, got him out. After that, he wanted to go back to, to be a pilot. They wouldn't let him, so he became a bombardier navigator. Mm. And with that, he went overseas, he flew in Africa. And I, I don't remember, but at one time, he flew somebody, I was a navigator on a B-17 for somebody really big in North Africa or during the Potsdam uh, agreements or not Potsdam or in the Crimea yeah in the Crimea he was flying around there because he was he always hit the mark mm -hmm. so they knew to give him the, the, the those jobs but it was somebody very famous that he flew with and I can't remember who it was uh, when he was flying for the North African problems or invasion and all that, running the Africa Corps out. And then he flew on either B-24s, he may have flown on B-24s for the Pleost, Ple, Ploesti mission, mm -hmm. that's one where they really got clobbered. Oil fields. Uh, yep. But he flew B-17s also. And then after the war, he went to uh, Tinian. And he was on Tinian as a bombardier navigator when the atomic bombs were loaded on B-29. He was a B-29 uh, yeah. bombardier navigator that would fly back and forth over Japan. And he was there when they put the bombs in. Uh, I don't know if he actually saw it, but he was there. And he knew the, he knew the guy that was the bombardier navigator. They all knew each other. Yeah. The bombardier navigator yeah. on that one. And so he, he, uh, he got around. And then he, uh, after he survived that, he came... He came home, moved to Neosho, Missouri, settled down, and uh, he had five kids, and he, let's see, I'm still in contact, the youngest one was a captain in the Air Force, and he retired as a captain, okay. and, and he's at, in, uh, the Air, outside the Air Force Academy in uh, Colorado Springs. Um, I don't think any of others, none of there was family that was ever in the military except that one son. So anyway, he, uh, he became a teacher, and a mathematics teacher in high school, as I became a mathematics teacher in middle school, <laughs> which is tougher than yeah. people realize. Anytime people say, oh, teachers have it easy, I say, I'm going to get you a week gig. Yeah. In a math class, I'll write all of it, all the lesson plans. You just go in there, and if it's somebody famous, it, what, one of the problems is, if like the mayor goes down there, or somebody to see how the school's really doing and teaching or something mm -hmm. like that, the band goes first, or the majorettes go first. The band goes next. They come in in their sedan chair, and you know, and all the kids realize you better stay in shape. Right. And they don't get, they don't have a clue as to what's going on in a classroom or average teacher. Plus, neither do the most of the time do the people who yeah. run the place. Yeah. The administration, they're, they're just clueless. Yeah. And I say that with a lot of back. <laughs> <laughs>
So anyway, let's get back. Yeah, so he, he, he retired and went down there and taught mathematics and then uh, retired all the way. And I, we went out to his funeral, I forget when it was, uh, 10 years ago. And uh, my, my sister went into dementia and then she passed away. And so they're together yeah. in, in Denver. And that's my my fam immediate family, except with the ones up, Morgan Morgan. And uh, he was he was actually colonel in the British Army. Yeah. And then his son was a captain in the Revolutionary Army, but on the frontier. Yeah. And then uh, there's one right under him who uh, became a judge. Oh. Morgan Morgan was the first judge of Winchester, right out here, was the first judge. Okay. And uh, they have a cabin out there, too. His, his original cabin, it was made into a chicken coop. Hmm. And but then the, the, some of the historians came out and uh, put it back together. Uh, I have a, a plaque with seven, a 1729 or something on it uh, that came out of the old wood that they right. had to recondition right, it. Right. I got two of those, one for each of my kids. And I have a mantelpiece from my from my grandfather's back into the early eighteen hundreds out of that. It was actually a log fort, two story log fort with interlocking logs that had a clapboard on it. And when I saw it at sixteen, just a clapboard house. When I went over there when they were tearing stuff down, mm -hmm. That was big loss. I got two of them out, and I had one of them made into a mantle, which is right over the fireplace. Wow. And I had about six grandfathers born in, in, in within <laughs> 50 feet of that. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's interesting. Yeah. So that is the story of, of my clan. All right. Uh, Very cool. Very interesting story. A lot of, lot of military in the family, and yeah. especially your father. And yeah. Gets Very in cool. the blood, I guess. Yeah, it does. You're right. You're yeah. right. Well, on behalf of the Americans in wartime, thank you for sitting down and talking to us, taking some time thank out of your day. Thank you for listening to me. Yeah, and thank you for your service and for your family's service. Well, thank you.